So, hello and welcome to the first ENI monthly webinar. Uh, today, I am honored to have with us Thomas Lancaster from Imperial College in London, UK. He is going to talk about artificial intelligence and academic integrity. Before uh, we start, I would just uh, like to invite you to register for other webinars as well. It's a second Friday every month at uh, 1 Central European time, 12 UK time, uh, and apparently 9 o'clock in Australia and 7 in Canada, as we have guests from uh, Australia and Canada today with us as well. Uh, next webinar is October 14th. Uh, it's uh, about improving your skills as a thesis supervisor, and it will be led by Veronika Krasnichan and Tita Henek Blabolova from the Bridge Project. In November 11th, uh, Peggy Pavletic uh, from ENI Students Working Group will talk about celebrating the European Year, year of Youth through academic integrity, how students help in establishing institutional integrity and values. And in December 9, uh, we, uh, Rita Santos from the Faith Project will talk about our new portal, support for victims of academic misconduct, an interactive portal and support network. So just register on uh, the ENI website, academicintegrity.eu slash vp slash ENI monthly webinars. So, without further ado, uh, Amas, welcome. Yeah, hello there, everyone. Thanks for joining me for what is the first of the series of ENAI monthly webinars. Great to be with you. It's a little bit of a, a somber day in the UK today, where we're in our 10 days of mourning following the, the sad loss of Queen Elizabeth II yesterday. But, um, one thing that the Queen saw during her long life was the many changes in technology that surround all of us and the developments in artificial intelligence, which is what I want to share with you during this webinar. So I have a lot of windows open on my screen, including the chat. Very happy to be interactive during this. So feel free to share your thoughts and comments as well as we go through for this one. But if we find my controls, which managed to hide themselves away around the background, there they go. We'll say happy for you to go ahead and share your thoughts elsewhere as well. You can tweet at me at Dr. Lancaster. We've got the at ENA Integrity Twitter as well. Hashtag Academic Integrity. I can see we've got more people joining us as we speak and the recording will be available, but the more we have, more people we have seeing this material, the better. So this is an entirely a new set of slides as well. And what I want to think about really is um, about the future. What is the world we're going to live in? My background, I suspect a few people here have met me before and spoken to me before, but I'm a computer scientist by trade. I'm I'm somewhat of a lapsed computer scientist in that I don't teach cutting edge programming or anything like that anymore. My role is much more based around student support. I teach things like ethics. I work with a lot of final year project students. And so I see their great ideas and great technical minds, but mine is not quite as fast in there. But I do have an understanding as a computer scientist about artificial intelligence that perhaps is uh, not not consistent across everyone. We have some other people, I'm sure, with a background, similar background here, but I'm not going to go into loads of technical details. I'll just try and cover what I hope will be useful in this, as Sonia says in the chat, amazingly global webinar for this one. But also to think about academic integrity in the future. What does this mean? And this is very much ideas work in progress because we're in such a fast moving field now. And I guess I can add to that by saying that at the uh, European Conference of Academic Tech in Plagiarism in May, I gave a short talk about artificial intelligence. Practically nothing from that talk has survived to now in September, which is only four months later. So nearly everything today is fresh. I think every slide is fresh, although 
there is some overlap and it just shows how quickly this field is moving on. There's one major development, which I will come to, which I think is quite a game changer for that one. I also wrote a book chapter in the Cheating Academic Integrity Collected book, which was published uh, quite recently. I think it's now officially published there, looking at contract cheating, which is my, one of my main areas of research, and what the next 30 years will be like. And that was incredibly difficult to write because I was writing this knowing that technology was changing all the time. But being an academic text, the, the authors were quite rightly asking me to, to cite and reference and give evidence for everything as much as possible. And let's be frank here, we can't imagine what the world is going to look like in 30 years time from an educational perspective, because there are just so many changes going on. Uh, that book, by the way, has come out of the International Center for Academic Integrity, the sister organization to ENAI, who we are here with today. Perhaps most importantly, something of a warning. So my research since 2006 has focused a lot on contract cheating, students paying or using a third party to complete their assessed work for them. I, I was shouting about this for a long time. Nobody was really listening and just ignoring it. And this allowed the industry to grow to be worth uh, more than a billion dollars a year supplying work to students. I am concerned that if we don't think about artificial intelligence now, try and future proof our teaching, our assessments, then we're going to leave it too late. We're going to be in the same, um, we're going to have the same challenges, the same problems we had before and be too late to do anything about it. It's almost that, are we letting the genie out of the bottle type question for that one. So, so it is a warning. It's also an opportunity as well, which I will come to. So a question really to go at everyone is what should a professor do? Well, more specifically, what should this professor do? I've I've edited out the, uh, the, the maths he was writing on the whiteboard in the background for this one, being your typical type of maths professor for this one there. Well, I'm not really expecting this professor to do a great deal because actually he's a completely fake person. This person is, is not a professor. It is very easy to go out there and to fake things. I mean, that's what actors are. That's what models are in marketing materials out there. But actually, rather telling you a bit of a lie here, this person is not a person at all. This person is entirely generated by artificial intelligence. So there's there's probably some semblance in truth in that we have a lot of um, professors who look something like this. That you may notice a bit of an imperfection if you were to stare at his glasses and his eyes and they don't quite join up. But if you know how to use image editing software such as Photoshop, you could quite easily go around that one and change it there. And I'd say, I think nearly all of the images in this webinar, apart from ones like the, the book cover on the previous slides, are generated by AI or heavily edited by AI or a combination of both. And incredibly useful for me as someone who likes to put a lot of images into presentations, particularly when they're online, incredibly potentially dangerous and dishonest if misused. Think of all the opportunities of fake news that become available using this technology. And um, I'm going to acknowledge the AI. I'm not going to acknowledge, um, I've used a combination of use a bit of DALI in this talk, there's a bit of mid journey in this talk, there's a bit of stable diffusion in this talk there. In terms of this is a question in the chat, um, and often run images through more than one tool to get them where they're at. So for instance, for this image, one thing that you find with a lot of current AI image generation technology is it does not do a perfect job with human faces. So this needed a bit of extra work. It's still far from perfect because I will never claim to be, be an artist or anything like that, but it is better than the original output there. So what we are, and yeah, and even the, there's a little image of me on the first slide. That is not really me. That is about half of my face and half of what a computer generated thinks my face should look like there. 
and a little bit of cleaning up to make me look uh, much better than I do in real life for that one, even with the benefit of lighting. So it's amazing. So much doing. And of course, we see this technology all the time in um, the kind of the, uh, tools that students use. So whenever a student has a, has a very great Instagram profile with all these highly polished pictures that have gone through a face editing algorithm there, then that AI is already in public use and already known. But what we have really at the moment, I'm a computer scientist, we've got this bit of this conflict with these um, machine generated clip art boxes between the computer scientists and between the educational sector and academic integrity about where AI, artificial intelligence fits in. And I will probably say AI meaning artificial intelligence throughout this talk, because that is my background, uh, even, well, academic integrity is also my background, but I, I'm more used to the abbreviation of AI for artificial intelligence. Extra bit of confusion in the world there. But what we're seeing is people like my colleagues as a computer scientist who are doing all this world leading research the institution I'm at, huge research grants backing up the work they do and their job is to improve the technology if they were working on images to make those images more lifelike to make text generation better whatever it might be and at the same time this is being supported by huge businesses uh, firms you will know about investing heavily in this technology we're talking in the millions tens of millions in a firm for their own research being plowed into academia I'm supporting students who are working on this. I had had students working on image generation for the past couple of years. It's soon surpassed by the vast amount of data available to some of the commercial companies, but this technology is out there. So there's this conflict with both of my hats on between that uh, I can see this technology has to improve. I can see it will improve regardless what I was to say, because there's massive money in here, but I don't want it to be misused in an educational setting for students to get qualifications they don't deserve for this one. So a few, a few truths, I'm not going to go into the technical side of things for too much, but essentially artificial intelligence, in most cases, machine learning is just maths and stats. The more data you have about something, the more decisions you can make with a greater degree of accuracy, essentially. So if you have a huge quantity of images on a certain theme and you need to generate another image in a similar style, then you've got that information to back it up and to generate it. So it isn't a form of magic, it's more mimicking. It isn't necessarily cheap mimicking, and there are costs associated with these technologies, such as a huge amount of computer power needed to run many of these things, then uh, it is getting better. I have certain things I can run on my, my home PC. I'm presenting from home today. Certain things I need access to uh, GPUs, graphical processing units, or to cloud computing facilities to run, or, or to run um, with the energy crisis we have around the world at a, a cost that is achievable and feasible for that one. And the very best results that come out of these processes at the moment don't come out of just running a piece of software, getting a result and using it as is. They come out of having a good understanding about how the technology works and combining that with human intuition, human understanding of processes, human editing, whatever it may be. So we all use AI. We use it all the time. We might use it to control our plants. These again, by the way, are images of generated by AI, AI of concepts that I had. The one on the left really started out as trying to generate a smart speaker, but it decided that a, a smart plant pot was more useful. And I thought, yeah, what about that nice technology that has been designed for me there? My plant pot is also my, my speaker. Our self-driving cars, that's all AI making decisions. Robot vacuum cleaners. I've already mentioned things like face, face apps, but that's an example of a, a, a face being improved, still slightly artistic looking in that example, but AI is there all around us. We use it all the time, whether we intend to or not. And so it's quite inevitable that we see AI being used in the writing process, because let's face it, what task do people find incredibly boring a lot of the time? It is writing. And 
we now live in a world where we need new content for websites, for news sites all of the time. And these are just a few examples of the type of writing services, AI generated writing services or writing support services that you can find online. I've deliberately chosen some slightly quirky ones, not ones that I would use myself, but you can get sites now that optimize for generating adult content there uh, you want your harry potter fan fiction for uh, an adult audience you can generate it using using these services because that's the kind of thing people write for that one uh, you want a business pitch writing for you you can do that or you can get the bare bones that you flesh out uh, even got the kind of things that um, can generate for your online shop selling cannabis, the best descriptions for your products are all kinds of systems out there for uh, writing descriptions to help you to sell more products and better marketing quality materials. And the words at the bottom, and this is for commercial writing, not for academic writing, quality driven plagiarism free AI writing. Plagiarism free is one of the terms you may recognize if you've seen work on contract cheating or if you've education where students do not want to be detected as being um, unoriginal. Exactly the same someone writing web content, they don't want to be detected as being unoriginal because they will be penalized by the search engines and their web pages will not be shown in the search engine results. So therefore they won't make any sales. So this is a, a commercial decision as well. But of course, we're all here because we're really interested in academic writing. I'll use the term essays as a catch-all for different types of academic writing. And these are the, the kind of services you can find online with a little bit of hunting around. I'm going to try not signpost them too much, just not to make it too one-stop easy for anyone wanting to go away and use these. But they, they are out there. Uh, and I will note that a lot of the, these general writing services that I've just showcased on the previous slide, or some of them are general writing services, you can plug, you can ask for essays using those services as well. But a few things that interest me, let's start with the one at the bottom right. Write high quality essays in seconds from a firm called Good AI. You may have your own opinion about whether that terminology is the, the best way of describing it, but they make it look three step easy choose your topic get a generated essay and um, then edit it using the artificial intelligence supported features they have available on the site now i do not want you to think these sites are going away generating perfectly referenced essays on topic in one click i don't think in general they do but their technology is getting better and you can see other other examples out there, different types of essays you can generate, Smoded author there, descriptive, argumentative, one-click essay generator. Uh, uh, incidentally, the examples on the left also seem to have links with contract cheating provision. In other words, if you're not happy with your automatically generated essay, then there is an immediate option to go out there and to buy a custom written essay from the firm. So this is now is just another method that essay writing services have to get customers into their marketing funnel through the essay generating type software there, which is not quite, yeah, very easy to get this running on your site with or without a cost involved. And you may notice the one at the bottom has got quite an obvious hyperlink to also a direct writing. They also have editing services. Editing is almost like writing in many cases. But who knows if these firms are using this technology at the other end as well. So I want to show you something that I've been working on that may or may not work in a, a live demonstration setting. I think I've got three hopefully live demos as we go through today. So I teach a module called Academic Integrity in STEM, which is offered at Imperial across disciplines. Essentially, the students have uh, an, an introductory session with me, uh, and I go through some academic integrity concepts, particularly looking at the ideas like academic integrity is for everyone that we were talking about just before the 
webinar started today, that it isn't just for students, and it is more than just do not plagiarize and reference for that one. So what I've done is I've tried to recreate that assessment. It's just a one page assessment within just almost a plug and play artificial intelligence tool for that one with the idea that you give it an academic subject and you generate the introduction to that reflection for this one using GPTJ, which is uh, essentially open source version of a large network. So anyone got any preference for an academic subject to try not to obscure, hopefully may or may not work. And just while people are not typing anything in, then I will say what I've done is I've just trained this using 10 introductory paragraphs from real student work here to see what kind of things we get back there. Uh, so interesting question it is trained on STEM subjects only for that one. Um, I mean, I will try nutrition as that is in the chat. I don't know whether it will be particularly specialized for that one there. I mean, but let's we've just brief, perfect timing. So So let's leave that whirring away and see what we get there. Let's zoom in. Um, and the reason we generate multiple ones of these is because the results may or may not be particularly great. Um, what kind of things we get? The concept of academic integrity is important to all the students, whether they're in the first year or in the higher years, honesty and respect got the second one. Um, so we've got the, the values there, integrity, honesty, and trust about not plagiarizing, an important concept. And then you may find quite interestingly enough, the, the third one is not particularly close to the original prompt at all. But that's why we have several different versions of that. Now, I mean, it will perform slightly better in other subject areas. It would also perform better, I believe, and this is a, a work in progress, if I was to use a paid model in the background. But what we can do sometimes is to take several of these paragraph generations to chain them together and to, to get a reflective exercise out of here. And it's something that's a bit more experimentation with, but it is very much set in the field for where I see things going in the future for that one. So just giving an idea about where things are. So reflection is often something we say will, um, of course the problem is lose. There we go. So ref yeah, so reflection is one of the things we often ask students to do because it's a very useful skill for them to have and to develop, but also sometimes it can be relatively easy to fake there. But I imagine, yeah, we get slightly better results with more more common subjects for that one. In terms of my training data, incidentally for that, a lot of the, the students' reflections were not that personalized to their discipline either. But we can also look at things like more technical assignments. This is one of the big advan advances I've seen in the, the past few months. And I, I shared an example a week or so ago on Twitter about generating web pages with, with one click, in this case, using the uh, OpenAI, a large commercial company working in this field, despite the name Open in that, and their Da Vinci model of text generation to generate web pages on academic integrity. And you can generate multiple versions of this. This was the the kind of thing that you you get back here. And let's um, let's have a look at this model and see how this one goes. So this is this is uh, OpenAI. This is their playground. You can essentially just type in a load of different things you might want it to do. And this is not computer code. 
for that. But in this case, hopefully this is this is visible without me trying to zoom in too much there. But it's a fairly standard prompt. So what I'm asking this system to do is to generate the code for a web page and to also generate the text for the web page. And so essentially the instruction is replace the dollar quoted exp expression, so everything with dollars around it with the appropriate content. So um, it's going to generate a file called index.html. It's going to generate a title for it. It's going to write an introductory paragraph and have a table with five questions and answers. And I've just added a disclaimer that this is not real here. So let's let's try and run it. Now, my experience with this, that it has maybe about a 50% success rate to get something useful out of it for this one. But you can see there it is actually it's generating HTML code here, which is those um, angled brackets, essentially. It's generating some text. You may see some questions that are, are flashing by. Ah, there's a something I probably forgot to change, which is I have not made this text generation quite long enough to, to finish the web page. But that essentially is going to be the code for a web page. And it just needs something to close off the page at the bottom. Let's just try that one again, but let's, um, you could very easily replace this with a different topic other than academic integrity, but not too obscure if anyone has got some, any ideas for this one. I'm going, I'm going to try, okay, while you're thinking, well, I've, oh, I, oh, beekeeping, yeah, that's a great one. Let's, let's see if we can generate a web page about beekeeping, the kind of thing you might ask as a school homework assignment. I have no idea what will come back, but we're getting the, the web page code again here, beekeeping. Beekeeping is a great way to produce your own honey and help the environment. Here are some frequently asked questions to get you started. How many bees are in a hive? There can be up to 60,000 bees in a hive. There, various others. There's possibly a bit of extra code you might not need there. But if I was to, well, this is where my attempts to copy things in into a wet into a, a notebook window and open it just save it somewhere i can find it as index html i'm sure some people just looked at that and said well it hasn't actually quite completed the page so it's not going to be the the best rendering well it's pretty close there we go so it's generated a, a web page it's it's generated the a nice table, incidentally, um, with a bit of color coding. It's, it's not quite perfect. You notice this extra bracket there. And I don't think we had a close HTML tag at the end for anyone who knows a little bit about HTML generate and how web pages are written. But it's, um, it's, it's not too bad. I, I could clean that up as somebody who knows what I'm doing very quickly. How do I think this text is is generated? I think this particular model has got millions of words loaded into it, some taken from existing um, yeah, existing web pages, existing wiki pages, probably existing books. And so it's learnt the format of how to construct uh, sentences. It's learnt what is associated with beekeeping there. It is not quite necessary doesn't necessarily know anything about beekeeping but it knows about what format of words go together and so essentially it knows the underlying ideas if i was to run this through something like turn it in well turn it in is not great for web pages and there isn't a great deal of text here uh, i don't expect the overlap level to be that high because it can express ideas in many different ways and so you need a little bit of technical ability to understand what's going on there but not a huge amount of technical ability. And there are very, I, I will say for anyone watching this with more of a technical mindset, the, the impressive bit to me is the fact you can generate the HTML as well. 
fairly standard format as opposed to generating the content. Now in, in practice, if I was going to develop a system to do this, um, then there's a setting here called temperature, which essentially controls how unique the output is. The high number are more likely to give you creative, unique output. And to generate very good HTML, you need that number to be really low because the HTML has to be in a prescribed format for it to make sense. And to generate creative and interesting answers, you need a high number there. So what I would really do would be to split this into two systems, one to generate the HTML and one to generate the text. But you could very easily, without knowing anything, if I wanted, I'm not going to try it live, I could add something like, uh, add a funny quote as an instruction and it would go away and try and do it. So quite powerful technology. You can generate programming code with this if you know what you're doing as well. And there are more specialized systems coming online too. So. Um, this is this is where things are moving. Um, Carol says the higher the number, the more likely the information is to be false. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, the more creative it's going to be. If you look at the examples I shared on Twitter about um, academic integrity in, in one of them, completely unprompted, it generated a quote about academic integrity. I can't remember what it was now, but the quote was was um, was either a false quote or was assigned to somebody who I have no level of, uh, I, I don't believe necessarily wrote that quote or, or said that quote. So yes, but, but creativity of course can be useful in a lot of contexts, like if you're working on fiction, for instance, or like if you're wanting things to be a bit more unique. Again, the real power of the system like this comes from taking this away and you could do a little bit of a quick editing at the end as well. So. Yes, a lot of this is playing playing around, but these things are not that difficult to to work out how to to get going with them really. So, so, uh, yeah. So, what well, the the higher the number, so that number I showed you, and there were several numbers on the slider. Uh, the higher that number is, the more creative the AI will be. In other words, the less likely it is to stick exactly to that prompt. That's uh, there's there's better descriptions, but. Um, but there are also things that I can say in the settings like, how often do I want the page to repeat the same ideas? And if I was just generating text, I could let it gener be very creative. But because in that particular page, I needed the HTML to make it look like a web page, that's the code around it. I had to have quite a low number because if it tries to invent its own way of, um, of its own version of HTML, the page will look a complete mess. So that's why you don't necessarily do all those things in one step, but you can do, and it works with that one. Yeah, and um, Alison has shared in the chat as well, an example of generating an essay using a paid tool. And yeah, you can very much use paid tools. I'm just um, sticking slightly more with with other tools today, purely because I don't want to give all the paid tools my, my money, but there you go. Uh, so I can generate um, graphics. This is where I see things Move it well, and also the reason I'm sticking with this is because I've just been playing around with the technology, and I want to show you what's possible. Because if you want to get more specialized results, you have to have to go a bit further into the code. There, uh, so we got a an academic integrity prize winner. Of course, this is not a real person. We have uh, just like in the chat, Alison generated an essay on contract cheating. Of course, I generate pictures about student plagiarism. The picture on the right is what systems think that student plagiarism looks like you can draw your own conclusions about how it's um come up with that answer there but there's certainly two people i guess that helps you can end up with some very odd looking pictures like this person who was meant to be with a brass statue and reading but has become ingrained with it or a student there who is working hard on their homework so they look reasonably good imperfect uh, I sometimes, you know, I, I can, I can, the, the downside of playing around with technology is you can decide you want to spend a while generating lots of clip art as I've done here. So I now have all the clip art I might ever need, which is not quite the same as commercially available clip art, but which I could just slip onto a slide to give it a bit of power and illustration. Some of these you may notice slightly better clip art than others, but they all give you an idea about what's going on there. Um, 
And I can generate huge amounts of art in different styles here. Um, again, this fairly random collection of things that I just found in my, my generated files in different styles. For that one, some of them much more interesting than others, like my, my little panda bear who's graduating towards the right of the page for that one, for this one. So Thomas asks a very interesting question. Who is the, the author of these? And we, we can, um, different schools of thought on this one. So I've been quite upfront in this talk by saying this is AI generated art and I'm not, not using it, um, hopefully to pretend to be anything else. Generating art is not a skillless profession. Well, profession is not a skillless activity because you have to know what to generate and you have to go through more than one step to do it. So let's just have a quick look at how this may work with another system here. So this is on, um, this is freely available. This is Hugging Face essentially um, implements a lot of academically defined algorithms and just uh, makes them available for people to, to play around with for that one. And this particular version will let me draw something and then it will try and turn my rough, rough drawing into some type of reality. Now, I'm not going to go completely free form in this one, although people who looked at my Twitter account may have seen that a picture of the Queen, which I generated using this in about 30 seconds yesterday when I heard the, the sad news. But um, if I was to say I was I'm studying concept art, which is common in a lot of universities, and I wanted my concept art done, then I might write something like a robotic dragon made of metal, say 3D CDI rendering with the Unreal Engine in concept art and cinematic, just to give it a few few ideas to work with. And then I might try and um, draw roughly what my dragon looks like. It looks nothing like a dragon, but let's, um, let's say it might have a bit of gold or something around there. It might have a little bit of orange on it or a bit of fire and perhaps a bit of green in the background. Let's, and then just click the button and see if it makes any attempt at changing my scribble into a real picture. Now, again, this model has got access to hundreds of thousands of previous images and the captions and associated information. So it may have an idea about what some of these different concepts mean, but not all of them. It may have a bit of an idea what a dragon looks like and uh, so on. Okay, so there we go. So let's see what we've what we've got. So it normally makes about four versions. It can make more than that, but it will discard any of them that are obviously adult images, which are possible using certain prompts. So this one is pretty interesting. It doesn't look much like a dragon, but it's sort of captured things, or maybe it does. Who knows what a robotic dragon looks like? Uh, this one has decided my yellow is sand or something like that. And the, this dragon should have a flag at the back. Uh, different style again, facing in the other direction, which I guess is vaguely following the trend lines I've drawn. Yeah. Um, and so on. And then what you can, you can go through as many stages of this as you want. So say I really like this image, but I didn't like the idea of this flag in the back. I could essentially almost draw over it in blue and tell it to have another go using that as the input there. Now, you may or may not think that is impressive. I'm impressed and I'm a computer scientist that you can do all of that. For this particular tool, you could also load in a photo to give it an idea of what color scheme you wanted, or you could find somebody's image online and plagiarize from it. So you see, we get a few other variants. It's perhaps a slightly too dark a blue, but it gives you an idea. You can get technology where you just write the prompt. This is called a prompt down here as opposed to try and give it a starting point as well. So imagine if you were studying on some kind of course with a large 
arts department, oh, sorry, with a large art component behind it, and you are generating images there. And this looks not dissimilar. I've been in a, in a university, in a faculty with a concept art degree. This looks not dissimilar to the kind of things students will create. They may have to create many versions of this, but it could certainly be used as a tool for inspiration, if not used completely as a tool for um, copying from. Now, I will say people who study arts, incidentally, quite often study art because they actually want to make art. So they may not be so keen to go away and fake their way through the qualification as we might be. But as somebody who can't do art, then that's difficult. Uh, so comments in the chat about this. The license then, um, th these models tend to be trained on whatever photos, because you can generate things that look fairly photographic, art that the model can get hold of. You can generate images that appear to have someone's signature in the corner because the art it's been trained on has a signature from the artist. So therefore the model thinks that the generated image should have some form of signature. So it will try and recreate that. It's, you, you can occasionally get watermarks appearing in there, although they're not watermarks of real companies because this has been trained on watermarked images. So yeah, there is a certain amount of stealing going on here there. But the generated image is, is unique. There is very little in the way of technology. Please correct me if I'm wrong, if you're a computer scientist, which will do a good job of mapping and matching generated images to what are likely to be the tens or thousands of images used for the basis of generating um, this new image, because it's learning the, the style, essentially, not learning the content. There. So the kind of technology we use for perhaps looking for textual plagiarism and similarity doesn't work very well in this area. I'm sure there are computer scientists working on that, but I haven't come across good results in that area. In terms of who owns this, now this is this is this is, this is questionable. That particular model I just saw is um, based on the stable diffusion data set, which essentially is open source. And so they have no claim to the images generated. So I I personally would not really claim to be the artist. I would claim to be the, I might claim to be the creator with some caveats or the generator there. Uh, there is a bit of debate about copyright in this area as well. It tends to stem from an American view of copyright, which um, says that the AI cannot copyright this, but it doesn't actually say who can. And the views on copyright, if you've ever looked at this, it's a minefield in terms of student work and research work. It's, all, it's, it's equally a minefield here that um, who owns this? But people will certainly put these images in books. People are publishing books of AI generated art. They are selling AI generated art. They're printing it on T-shirts. Um, it, it is all out there, very useful in certain circumstances. There is an ethical question it might be one to have with your students about what what happens with this. Uh, where it gets more controversial, incidentally, is what if you put in the name of an artist in this and you try and generate something in the style of an artist? So you may see I've got there um, uh, Mickey Mouse in Fantasia in the style of Van Gogh's Starry Night. There, um, make of that one what you will. It is, it is not quite Mickey Mouse enough, but it is to being used illustrative. And yes, there are there are Daleks in the style of wooden um, wooden ornaments generated, I think, in, in Octane or something like that I made there. So Felicity, well spotted. They're hidden away in the background. I ran out of space to put the caption on that page for that one. And yeah, I'm not expecting you to find anything identical, but of course there is an inspiration to so say my logo here. So you're doing graphic design. Here's a logo of a, a skateboarding company with a cat logo. Then you'll find inspiration for similar kinds of retro logos there. Um, so I would not expect Google image search to find the original photos for these, but I would expect that some of the inspiration may or may not come across. But that's just like if I, I could take a photo of myself now in my webcam, I could load that into Google image search. Obviously it's not on the internet somewhere. It will find some similar photos. Incident, you try that for yourself. It probably won't find you, but it might find people who look vaguely like you. So a certain characterization there for that one. 
so yeah so what deborah says students need to be taught how to use this technology ethically and i guess that's where i'm going to come into in the the final few minutes because this technology is there i'm not going to go through all of these but i could generate presentation slides using this put in a prompt it could generate will generate my bullet points for me i've done that before i um i can also generate layouts automatically you probably see that already in PowerPoint when you use it and it gives things like suggested layouts for your page based on what photos you've used. All that technology is out there for that one. You've, I'm sure you've seen apps where you take a photo of your maths question and you can get a step by step solution back. It's um, a sort of AI, I will say here for the benefit of a better phrase. You can definitely generate music because music is quite systematic in many forms for that one go away and play around that with that you can generate videos they're not completely ai at the moment but think if you've ever been on youtube and every video you've seen when you've clicked on something it turns out to be a robotic voice reading a set of text the text has probably been automatically generated the audio has been automatically generated and then some software has been used to synchronize it all together possibly in one step uh, literature view generation software is coming along quite well don't rely on the facts. And if you've got a programmer, you can start to personalize some of these systems too. So what do students think about that? We talked about ethics. This is just a discussion I saw on Reddit recently, that place where people think they can be very anonymous and post their thoughts about things. I'll just point you to the one at the top right. Someone who um, you look at their posts because they give a lot away. Seems like they're studying a I think a data science master's at a US in, um, institution there, who rather than going through all the boredom of writing his assignments and essays for himself, has gone straight to the GPT model, which is one I just showed you for creating that web page and um, created about 20 assignments. That's our grad student and the kind of things they want to do. Is it unethical? Probably. Is it illegal? No. That's their opinion, of course, for that one. Doesn't stop them doing this, even though they think it's unethical. There, someone else who answered that and essentially said, this technology is a tool. And I guess we can compare that as they have done that at one stage, you wouldn't be allowed to take a calculator into an exam hall. Now you probably can, because that's the tool you use. And so using these tools well has got a skill associated with it. So something to think about. Uh, we've also got in the chat there analogy using a sewing machine instead of hand sewing. Yeah, that's how technology changes and how we have to adapt for that one. But see what your students think. So, so what do we do about this? And this is early days. This is share your ideas. I think there'll be a lot of research, a lot of discussion in the academic integrity community about this over the next few years. I think a lot of things we say about contract cheating, essentially making sure students actively involved in the assessment process are incredibly useful. I want to stress again what I said very early on in this webinar, that artificial intelligence is not one stop at the moment. Even when you saw me there on generating art, I would have to go through a few iterations to get that how I wanted it. I would probably start again for that one. I may be happy in one iteration, like my jigsaw pieces, which I think was generated using exactly that same system I've just shown you, which were just a few scribbles to come up with something. And then I've removed the background for that one. But there is editing involved. There is work involved. There is thought involved. It's just different style of editing and thought and ingenuity than we've had before. And, and I guess particularly for written work, which is where I see this being used a lot, then don't you think that writers for contract cheating firms who are doing very standard type of essays and assignments who really don't want to write yet another first year business essay they are going to be using this kind of technology and they don't all have access like i do to previous student work to write my specific reflection which is why i'm not too worried about students going away for many reasons and faking that particular assignment there was a little bit more to it than i showed you on that slide 
But if you're doing a standard assignment about uh, nursing reflection, reflect on your placement and something that happened. They have lots of essays about nursing reflection they could use as a basis and they could build their own solution on. And there are definitely firms who are working on those very specific examples. So what kind of solutions can we think about? Again, throwing out ideas, they don't solve every problem, they may introduce new problems for that one. Uh, talk to students, same thing I say about contract cheating. Talk to students, asking if they know about this, asking what they think about it. Would they use it? Personalize this to your discipline. Get the students to try out some of these tools uh, whether it's tech space, whether it's uh, tech solutions, whether it's art, uh, whether it's even generating music in those fields and to see what this is like. They may be really useful. You're doing a broadcast journalism course, which nowadays means you're doing radio editing or you're making podcasts. You have an interview with somebody with a lot of background noise chances are you already use a system with a certain amount of artificial intelligence to remove that background noise and to make this audio better for your audience. Quite common. We might, um, I've used it occasionally for lectures where you've ended up in a noisy room. So AI solutions may be perfectly appropriate and relevant and almost expected. But what is there? And um, Alison says, currently worried about educating students on this topic. I don't have a good model for educating them yet. That's something we have to think about. So thoughts are all welcome on that one. Uh, do think about things that require a bit of local knowledge. So if I was to use that model I showed you early on, the Da Vinci one, and to set an assignment related to COVID, it does not have full knowledge about COVID because the data collection for that model finished sometime in 2021. It obviously has some COVID information, but not all of it. But it's going to limit what it can, can write about that subject. But of course, these models will, will keep collecting new data and being revised by them. Uh, what about if we use them to use, help students to use these to create a portfolio? You're doing, um, you're doing marketing and advertising. You need to show some of your marketing portfolio. Is it appropriate to use this kind of technology? There's an ethical question there, of course, as with so many things. One challenge is quite often getting consistency. If I was to run that same model I showed you 10 times, I would get 10 very inconsistent robotic dragons out of it. So it's not quite so easy as to say they all look the same, but there are different models available you can use to make things look more consistent. Our university processes, procedures, regulations, et cetera, are quite unlikely in most cases to even mention artificial intelligence use, should they? Do we need, is, it, um, is there a catch-all elsewhere? Have a look at your own procedures and see what they say. Uh, my universities, I'm, I'm not directly involved with any development of the processes, but I know they have not addressed this yet there. And of course, I work in a discipline where a certain amount of AI is expected. Uh, real world and authentic assignments. A student is going to go into a business where they then use this technology in the business. Therefore, you might argue we have a duty to make sure they use this technology in the classroom, but we have to be able to differentiate between when relying on technology, as people have said in the chat, even when relying on a Grammarly or a calculator, when that's appropriate as to when that's not appropriate. There are things like building up assignments in stages that may perhaps make it slightly harder to go through this route. Now, having things that are supervised in the classroom, you could use the word examine there if you chose. And also the idea of inspiration. Uh, if I was doing art, I just want a few ideas about um, what my dragon would look like. I could run that system I showed you 20 times and just come up with a few of those and then it could inspire me. If I was writing my reflection, I could run that a few times, come up with ideas about points I might make, but write my own. Of course, that's the same argument that contract teaching providers will make about saying they provide sample essays to inspire you. It doesn't always happen in the, the real world. We, we don't know what we're going to do about this. There's little knowledge about what best practice is. Do share this in your own disciplines. Do think about this problem. Do think about your colleagues as well. We're here, the, the group of us today, the people hopefully watching this afterwards, because we are passionate about this, because we see the future, because we want to be ahead of the curve. But 
Um, a lot of people have not even thought about this. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm enthusiastic about some aspects of this technology there, but it's not the case for everyone. I, uh, I got an email from our PhD student group yesterday inviting me to the, the weekly pizza that they have at Imperial with our computing students with a picture of um, an AI generated pizza on holiday because it's the first session back after the pizza holiday break there. So people are going to use this just as a regular thing. And they might use it for comedy, they might use it for fake news. Uh, what's our evaluation metric? Just something to think about as we have a research field. Uh, but what is the conflict here? Let's go back to this conflict. I don't like conflict in education. We've got the established practice, but we've also got to do the best for our students. And to me, do the best for our students means don't ignore, as Mary says in the chat, transparency, appropriate practice. And also, as we do for contract cheating, the dangers, that things don't always look very good. I didn't show you generating a human. It's amazing how many humans that get generated through that system with six fingers on the hand. Now you can just regenerate it and get around it, but it does happen there as well. And can we make sure that our students are ready for employment? Can we partner with them there? Let's hope this person isn't really in our chemistry lab because you may look at this and pick up a few health and safety concerns with that one. And you may question the, the interesting colorful chemicals that could be better put in a, um, in a witch's lab rather than a chemistry lab. But um, I have generated some really great prospectus images incidentally with this technology, just dating back to my student recruitment days. But um, what do our students think? Big project here. We want them to go on to education and life as Miranda has said there. We want them to understand what goes into writing. Yeah, definitely. We don't want to just generate writing. We also want students to recognize real writing from fake writing, just in, in the way of fake news. Just think about how much text can be automatically generated for the web as well. And that's how all these fake stories get propagated, how our social media feeds get filled with misinformation. And you can get very realistic looking images that can be used for things like conspiracy theories nowadays that could be used to show aliens landing on Earth or um, whatever your favorite conspiracy theory may be that look like a realistic photograph, much more realistic than what I've put on this closing slide. So there is very much an ethical question about um, can we do nothing? there, not just to prevent academic misconduct, but also to promote academic integrity. So that's really what I just have to say in covering the wide range of grounds of technology that will not stand still, that will continue to change all the time for this one. So I, I hope that is useful. And thanks in the, oh, thanks, Carol, there for was describing my talk as thrilling, which I hope is the sentence you wrote and was not generated by artificial intelligence. Well, right. Sonia, over to you. So thank you so much for this amazing talk. I was trying to create different images straight away while listening to this. Uh, it's really, you are opening a, a Pandora's box here, I feel, and uh, I really, enjoyed the talk i want to i just have a question do you think we should start thinking about new policy documents and including this uh, type of artificial intelligence generating content uh, I, I yes a hundred percent that was very that was that was up there in the corner of one of the slides but mm -hmm. there, are, there are people who, are, who spend their life working on policy much more than i do but we definitely need a statement there uh, and we just need, uh, I would almost say in an individual assignment brief, ask academics to stress what level of use of external technologies is appropriate. What, what can be done, what can't be done. I'll give you an example from as a computer programmer that we, um, in, in industry, it's quite acceptable to go away and reuse pre-existing code because why write it again if somebody has written code that solves a problem? But we need um, our first year students, we need to be able to verify they can write their own code from scratch. So 
we would want to make sure that we had an equivalent statement in our briefs which said that uh, that essentially captures what I just said there. And it's the same for this technology. Mm. At what level are you allowed to rely on external services? Or if you do, do you have to acknowledge them in a certain way for that? Uh, we have one last question. I have one last question uh, in the chat. Do you think that the increasing open source is an important reason uh, for artificial intelligence? Or I, I suppose it's artificial intelligence, it's AI. It can be both. <laughs> Uh, it could be both the, the AI versus AI, artificial intelligence, academic integrity, for that one. Um, I mean, good artificial intelligence or machine learning specifically depends on large amounts of data and information. The more data you have, the better the results will be. And so the more open, uh, the more information there is on the web, think of the speed, the pace of um, information growth there, then... Yeah, the better the solutions will be. And of course, there are many people who believe all information should be open and free. There are many programmers who make uh, their results freely available, they make their code freely available. Uh, other people build upon that. It's a brilliant community aspect of things. But this also means technology gets better all the time. And so open, yeah, so open source has great, has good thing, good points, bad points. I think the good outweighs the bad, but we have to adapt to it as educators and as the academic integrity community and as people who want the best for our students. So thank you so much uh, for this amazing talk. As uh, Felicity said in the chat, you are in the cutting edge all the time. Uh, and so thank you for opening. I'm, I'm certain we are going to hear more about this topic uh, in the future. But thank you for introducing us to that. And thank you, everyone, for listening. You will be, we'll be back in a month with a new webinar uh, from the Bridge Project for Supervisors and Academic Integrity. So welcome back. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.